Hey everyone, welcome to class. Um, uh, by the time you, you get this message, I'm pretty much out the door on my way to um, catching a flight. Um, but I wanted to make tonight an asynchronous uh, class so that we maximize our time um, and, uh, and continue the project as we move forward. Um, this would definitely take longer than the few minutes that I had speaking with you tonight. So, uh, or the time that we were allotted. So uh, just take this video as kind of like a lesson in and of itself, and then go ahead and work on your projects, apply some of this information from the video, from this lesson this evening. And then um, on next week for our next session, um, we'll check in and look at your designs, which will push the due date um, even further um, for the following Thursday. So I think we'll, that should make sense. We'll be okay with that, okay? So the thing that I wanted to uh, review today was to go over, and let me go ahead and switch over here so we can take a look at that, is, um, let me give you the title, actually. And that way I can switch over so we can take, uh, take a peek at it. Here we go. So the idea for this evening is like, how do we um, composite our graphic onto the t-shirt template? So, you know, the objective is to composite a graphic onto a t-shirt template. So uh, what, what are some of the steps um, to compositing that, copying and pasting onto that uh, template? Where do I get that template? And do we need to put, potentially add uh, some type of lettering or font to it as well? So, which kind of lends into typography. So. We're gonna go over that right now. And the first thing um, we're going to do is that we're basically going to look at um, the template as you should receive it um, here in Adobe Illustrator. So when you get the file, you should technically have three t-shirt templates that you can work from. Um, you can, uh, the best thing I would say is, is that if you have one design, try three different color ways for your t-shirt on that graphic or if you have more than one design and let's say you have two different uh completely different graphics or maybe even three then you could put one on each of those t-shirts and experiment that design that way too i feel for the most part that um that most of the class has one graphic and you have an opportunity tonight to maybe test three different colorways or change it um in a one template but try to three different colorways um so that you can see it side by side and do a comparable the reason I have this format is because um, it's, it's a lot easier to see your design or various versions of the same design um, on screen. Uh, sometimes we kind of mistakenly think that if we make a lot of changes on our file um, that we're going to remember all the details. That might work for one or two designs, but when you're a professional graphic designer, you, te you technically want to have, um, not only for yourself, but even for your client or for, your, for the studio that you're working for, your, your graphic design manager, or whoever's your supervisor when you're starting, you definitely want to have some, some variations, some versions of your design, so that you can show the viewer, the client, um, your thinking process. So um, I've gotten so used to this format that I do it for myself, just so that because of all the graphics and all the things that I do on a day-to-day -day basis. It's hard for me to remember every graphic detail as you get older, maybe it's just me, but I always like to have some comparables so that I can compare, okay? So that's the reason why we have more than one. You don't have to, um, but I, I like to have two to three different versions of a design so I can compare it. And I even go as far as to save the file, go to sleep, and the next day when I've rested or I've done some activities, I can open my designs with a fresh eye. And you'll be surprised how many small details or things you notice when you um, see it a day or two after working on it. So those are, those are the reasons why I do this. Moving on, okay. Now, to find this template or this file, we're gonna go to Canvas. And so I'm gonna go back onto my Canvas system. 
and we're going to go on our project page, which is this template here. There we go. And to find the template for your t-shirts, it's actually um, the vector shirt template, which is located um, underneath this file. So if I were to annotate this, you're going to go to the vector shirt template, which is underneath the lecture presentation link in our assignment uh, post. And when you click onto it, you're going to find the Adobe Illustrator file ready to go. So it's labeled t-shirt template on the upper left-hand side. You're going to see, um, you're going to see it actually in, in a vertical view format, but it's basically that first view that you saw in Adobe Illustrator. They're laid out side by side on one document, but it's basically there in front of you. It looks like this in Google, but when you download uh, on the upper right hand side here, you're going to click to download. When you download the file and open it, it'll basically uh, open like you saw in Illustrator, those three horizontal uh, templates side by side. So that's how you get your file. Okay, make sure you download it. Again, that's going to be here in the vector shirt template found on our t shirt assignment post in Canvas. Okay, so make sure you download it. Once I have it downloaded, then I can now start to uh, think about copying and pasting my graphic onto uh, my template. So switching back to Adobe Illustrator, I'm going to go to my file. And I hope you don't mind, James, uh, but I, I, I found your graphic. So we're going to work with your graphic a little bit uh, for that. OK, so uh, James uh, is working on a, this particular concept of Mickey in this, in this environment. Um, and so I'm just gonna pretend that we're gonna try to adapt this onto our t-shirt. Now we have two different files, right? We have our template, which I've downloaded and opened, and then we have our graphic that, that we're developing. In this instance, it's like uh, very similar to how we copy and paste for our uh, character collage with our basic complicated shapes. You're gonna do the same thing. You're going to click on to your selection tool uh, which is the black arrow on the upper left-hand side there, right? Um, represented B on your keyboard. And you're basically going to um, click, hold a click and select all the graphics, okay? So you're just gonna select all your graphics and you're gonna go to edit menu, copy, or on a Mac, command C. If you have a PC, it's control C for cat. And you're going to click onto the other tab, which is the t-shirt template. And you're gonna go edit, paste or command V like Victor to paste, okay? Now, once you paste it in there, uh, you might have a very large graphic as, as this instance for, for uh, James's file. If that happens, uh, whether it's too small or too big, um, you can go ahead and go to the object menu and, and select group, or you can hit command G like Gary for grouping, or you can right click and group the file, which is this selection highlighted in blue towards the center there. Now, remember grouping is very helpful because grouping allows you to select onto any graphic and move it around, so that's nice. And I'm going to scale it down, okay? And just so that it's not too confusing, um, after I scale this graphic down, hold down the shift key, I'm gonna, scale down proportionally holding down my shift key okay now the shift key um, when i select the object and hit shift left click and take a corner and pull it allows me to keep the proportions of the graphic intact meaning if we look at this graphic that james created it looks like it's more horizontal or rectangular than square shaped everyone's graphics will be slightly different, give or take. That means, what I mean by that is that the proportion basically is a fancy word that means like, if I took two squares from the canvas of his design there and went across the, the image here, he is about and equally across. James's file is almost, has a proportion of three equilateral, equilateral squares across and two, almost like two vertical. 
also known as a three to two to three ratio. That means that it's more wide. It would take three perfect um, equilateral squares, right? Equal sided squares. Um, a perfect square it takes three of them to complete this graphic and about two to, to complete the graphic vertically. So it's more wide by a ratio of two, three, or two to three. Does that make sense? So that's kind of the ratio that he has here. Okay, so it's more wide. Now, if I hold down the shift key and click, hold the click and scale down, it keeps that three square wide, two square vertical orientation intact. So that's proportion, okay? If I didn't hold down the shift key and I just clicked and I eyeballed it, then it, we start to notice that the graphic starts to warp, squeeze, pinch, do some really weird stuff, right? And um, we wanna keep the proportions as close to the original drawing as possible, right? Um, any company, especially a Disney company that notices any type of squishing to their most loved and popular characters, it's a big no-no because the original drawing of the character, people remember that. We all remember the original proportion and scale. And if, and if something looks off or it looks um, squeezed or pinched or stretched, um, it almost, people feel like if they're buying this on a shirt, they feel like it, there's, that, that, that they're buying something that was um, inaccurate, uh, they, they, they might think it's cheap because it's been stretched or pulled. They might think it's a counterfeit because sometimes counterfeits do that. So any type of stretching, pulling, it kind of gives a sense of like cheap, counterfeit, uh, carelessness, almost like no one really put enough time and effort. And, and anyone that knows Disney, right? You know, they always talk about the quality of the art and the process and how it's you know, these really talented designers, right? And for, and for a graphic to be, they almost like lifted up to a level of perfection. So the moment they see anything that is opposite to what they communicate, perfection, I guess you can call it, or excellent art, then the quality, the value begins to drop. Does that make sense? So we always wanna try to keep the impression intact. Now, as I scale down, I'm basically placing the image um, about three inches to four inches from the bottom of the collar, okay? So what does that mean? Um, when, oh, don't want that. Whenever you're drawing or doing any type of production art, um, going back to my t-shirt days, you know, um, the art is, they always say that you always wanna put the screen about three fingers from the top of, or, the, or from the end of the collar. So uh, three to four fingers right? Because that's the area of the chest. And you can kind of see that um, for the most part. If I switch over to the screen here, if I take, you know, three or four fingers from the bottom of my, my shirt, let's just say that's a t-shirt and I go and I hold it down like this, right? Those three, those three to four fingers, right? Is about typically, you know, chest level where a, a shirt begins. You could argue that, you know, it's about three to four fingers starting for the highest point but the main graphic starts about, you know, right about the chest line here, but somewhere between three to, four in, three to four inches or three to four fingers from the end of the shirt, that's where it starts. And that graph and that distance between like chest line to here is about three to four inches. So to play it safe, if you, if you ever wanna do a t-shirt graphic and you're sending it off for printing, which a few of you I know are doing that, um, try to go start your graphic or the top of the graphic at three to four finger lengths from the top, which is about four inches from the edge of the shirt, if that makes sense, right? So that would put it like right about like here where my pinky is. That's where you start your graphic. And sure enough, even for this t-shirt uh, patch, it starts about that distance down, right? Not at the, at the ch at chest line, but almost at the upper chest line. That's about three to four fingers down. That's your, that's your starting point, so to speak, okay? So we're gonna do that and we're gonna just keep that in mind as you're designing your shirt. I'm gonna go back over here and I'm basically um, starting about there. And, and as I'm looking at the graphic, I'm asking myself, you know, I, I could change the color of the shirt. It doesn't have to be gray, right? So let's try that. Let's actually see if there's some interesting ways that we can integrate that graphic. Now, looking at the graphic here on the right, um, I'm gonna to point to that or actually draw a square. 
in my layers palette here, you're going to notice that there is three, three layers um, that have a little lock symbol. And it says shadows, shirt, and layer two. And then, of course, the Mickey says black and white, but I don't want it to say black and white. I want to double click this, and I'm going to call that my color Mickey. OK. Now, what is the, those layers, the shadow layers? Basically, where it says here, where it says shadows, those shadows in that layer there represent these little sort of shaded areas of the shirt. They look like a dark, darker gray, not light gray, but dark gray. That shadow layer in red, pointing in red in the layers panel on the right, basically is pointing to those dark shape shadows uh, on the left of your t-shirt graphic. They're kind of cut up that way. See, I'm flashing them in and out. So those are the shadows, okay? That's the shadow layer. The t-shirt is obviously the main shirt, which is a light gray. And then the layer two that you have, well, that's the, the body. That's basically the, the pants and that light gray uh, arm happening in the graphic. So the layer two is really the body. The t-shirt is your shirt. Shadows is the shadows of the shirt, which is a darker shade of the t-shirt layer. Okay, so in this graphic, I'm going to click onto the little tiny lock on the lower here on the left hand side. So where there's a little lock there for the shirt, I'm going to unlock that shirt and I'm going to click onto it because when it unlocks, I can select it. That's why it was locked. So anything that's locked, I can't click, I cannot click on. Anything that is unlocked or has no lock symbol, I can click onto it or select it. So I'm going to click onto it, and I'm basically going to go with my arrow key here. To the, oh, I missed out there. Uh, basically, I'm going to go to my fill tool, double click, and change the color, right? Maybe it's going to be a blue, sky blue, who knows? But I'm going to reactivate the t-shirt graphic and put it on there, OK? Now, that's not too bad but the dark shadows is kind of bugging me. And that's the shadows layer we just saw. So I'm gonna unlock that layer, okay? And highlight the shadow layer. Okay, so I click onto it and it's selected. There's no lock. And if I click onto the little circle on the right or just click onto this, the dark gray shadow, I can now select that and make it a darker shade of blue, or I can start with the pastel blue and go maybe five or 10 degrees darker on the, the main color. But I'm basically making it darker than the blue, right? So shadows are just darker shades of the base color. So if you have a blue shirt, dark blue shadows. If you have a red shirt, dark red shadows. If you have purple, dark purple shadows. So match it to the base color and get it go, go that way, okay? And just like that, um, I have my graphic change and set there, okay? So that's not too bad. I think this is okay for, for a round one concept, okay? For those of us that don't have like a font or wanna know how J James downloaded a Walt Disney font, um, then that's also found on our assignment page. So I'm going to flip back to our assignment page. And that font, let's go back to our Canvas page, is, you scroll up here, it's right, oh, make sure, making sure I have the mouse there. There we go. So that is actually on our assignment page under free fonts, or more specifically, free fonts to add character to your design. So right here, or the right, underneath that is two links. One is www.defont.com, and the other one is www.fontsquirrel.com. These sites are 
my go-tos, my favorite uh, web free sites for, for fonts. And you've seen that at one point as well, okay? I like to download fonts. Now you don't necessarily have to download fonts um, in to your system um, because Adobe actually can also offer you fonts as well in your system. And so we'll go, we'll go over like how you can find fonts in Adobe Illustrator, okay? In fact, we'll switch over and do that right now. When I want to find a font or just use the type tool in Adobe Illustrator, I'm going to come back to my file. And inside Adobe Illustrator, there's a tool here, oh, which looks like the letter T. And you guys may have seen that. Let's use the arrow key there. Take it, point to it here. It's right there where the T is pointing to, or the red arrow is, there it goes. Looks like a T for type tool, okay? You see it there in orange. Now the type tool is basically like your text tool in Google Slides uh, when you're pulling a, a, a text box into your graphic. So if you've ever done a presentation in PowerPoint or in Google Slides and there's a little tool, type tool and you can click onto it and type onto your document, it's, sim it's a very similar format, okay? You click onto T for type tool. And you'll see what looks like this sort of square with a black little tiny arrow on the upper left and what looks like this sort of cursor for typing on the right hand side. When you see that file, you see that cursor, it basically means that you're ready to click and start typing in the information, right? And it'll give you a term here called lorem ipsilum, which is kind of like the uh, sort of like a test, test text. It looks like a text box that you normally see in any other editing uh, program. And when I use my type tool, I can basically double click onto the letters to highlight it and I can type in a word like Mickey Mouse, right? Or, you know, World of Disney, okay? Go back to selection tool. If I wanna change the font, and I'm in my type tool, then if I go to window and click on to or select the type menu, I can go to the character panel, also represented by command T or control T like Tom or type. And, it, and this window will pop up that's in the center of my screen. It looks like a character menu. And this looks like something you've seen in Google Slides or, or PowerPoint or any Google document or Microsoft Word, um, it's a character menu. And this basically means that's your font menu that you can select by clicking onto the uh, little upside down V or drop down menu on the right where it says Myriad Pro here. If I click in here, I can actually select the little arrow on the right and see the whole, all the fonts that are built into my system. I'm gonna move it up, click onto it. And these are all the fonts that are built into my system. What's kind of cool about this is that as you click it and you and hover over a font, you see it previewed in your text. When, when only when it's uh, selected, right? Not when it's not selected. You have to click onto it and then go to the character menu to see the preview. So what's kind of nice here is I get to preview it really quickly to get a little bit of a feel and a flow of what's out there, okay? Now, if, you, if there's a font that you don't see in your system, then right underneath here, see if I can highlight that and hopefully the annotate doesn't look, disappear. Ah, makes it disappear. I'm never, I'm never a fan of the zoom version here. Let me move it down. Ah, okay, select. Okay, it should be right there where that second arrow is on the right. You see where it says here, find more? So on the left, it says, fonts, blue line underneath it, where my red arrow is pointing to on the right, towards the center of your screen, it says find more. If I click onto that, it allows me to activate Adobe fonts instantly, and it, it's going to initialize um, pretty much the font family or Adobe fonts, okay? And you can find more by classifications, activated fonts, things of that sort, but it's initializing it, okay? 
if it was activated instantly and it's initializing, technically what would happen here, what you would see happen is that it would open up uh, a, a site, which is like the Adobe fonts. There it goes. It took a minute. <laughs> and these are more fonts built in to your account uh, under Adobe. So Adobe has another service called Adobe fonts. And what Adobe fonts is, is that it basically is uh, um, free fonts that is linked to your account that you can download from the cloud into your system. So basically these are fonts that Adobe has purchased by license that it, they've given to all their designers and you could search through their font family for lots and lots of more uh, fonts, okay? So if you, if you like going to the font and then basically downloading fonts for those who are a little bit more familiar with what I'm saying, then this kind of skips that step and you can go to Adobe's collection of fonts and activate it and save you the time from going to those fonts and finding them. Does that make sense? So it gives it to you, it allows you, uh, because, and it gives you a lot more of a selection of, I would say like better quality fonts um, because it's allowing you to go into it. It does take a minute for it to preview because it is kind of uh, pulling from a server in the cloud. But if you like a font that looks really interesting, you know, let's say it's something like this Americana uh, font, uh, Americana 8. Then you can click onto the little cloud on the right here where it says activate. See if I can point to it with my arrow key. Ah, got to ask the Zoom uh, team to kind of set it up. So oh, uh, find more. Uh, it's difficult, but, but you guys know what I'm referring to, right? Let me clear it out so we can not lose track. But basically, if you hit find more and you find a font that you like, Don, Don, 210 Don Watchit, let's say, I click to activate icon. I'm going to click the icon, activate these fonts by clicking the little cloud with the little download arrow, click OK to that. And basically, when I activate the font, it is now it should be selected once it downloads into my system. Okay. And it's currently activating, so it takes time. So there is a little bit of a delay when you're activating that font, but once it goes through, activate these fonts, okay, then it should activate it. I'm gonna click on the little star to the left to add to my favorites. And I could even ask Adobe to find similar fonts, which is that little wavy equal sign so that it could find similar fonts as well, okay? So there's a lot of things there that can be available. Okay, fingers crossed. I hit the activate icon. So it's going through the process of activation. So give it a little bit of time. It does take a little time for it to activate, but once it does, then it, you should be able to see it in your, in your menu. And that's, a, that's one way of selecting fonts into the system, okay? The other way that you could select a font is that you could download a font from the website like the font. And if you, download and select it from a site like defont.com, which I give you here in um, Canvas, then you can go through the process of downloading the font. Let's go to font squirrel. And you can find a font and download the font for free in your system. Okay, so let's say I want to look for a font on my list and I like this milkshake font or better yet, because it's offsite. Be careful, you don't, want to, you don't want the ones that are offsite because then they'll try to have you activate accounts. So let's just go with the um, Questa. Oh, it's giving me the option to download from FontSpring, which is a different site. I don't want that. What I want is to download directly from the, from the system. So this little blue arrow here on the right, I'm going to click on to download. So we'll just download Open Sans here. When I click onto it, 
you'll notice on the lower left hand side is a folder that is downloaded there. Okay. I'm going to click onto that folder and a window is going to pop up that's going to say, hey, I've expanded this folder. It's open. And here it is in your uh, download window here in, um, in red, or excuse me, in blue. It says Open Sans. Okay. I'm going to click on to the, click onto that folder. Double click. And it's going to give me a huge list of fonts that I basically can double click on to download and install. Okay, and this is how we used to do it back in the days. So this is an old school way of doing it. But basically, where it says open sans bold.ttf at the end, TTF means true type F for font. Okay, so if you see F, that means font, TTF, true type font. Okay. And if you, if you highlight a font and hit spacebar, you can see a preview on your screen and pops up. But let's say I, I want this bold sans at the top highlighted in blue. I'm going to double click onto that file. And I'm basically going to see a program open up, which is called the font book in, for Mac. And I think font storage for PC. Forgive me, I forget the name, but I know it's font book for Mac. And I'll see a window kind of pop up that'll say, hey, um, open sans bold. Do you want to install the font uh, here on the bottom, right? Do you want to install the font? Because currently it's not installed. I'm going to say yes to that, install the font. And when I install the font, then I should see a new window that pops up that looks like this. And it says open sans bold, name of the font. I have a slider here on the right that I can slide up and down so I can see the font in their sizes, okay? But when I see my font book open and it says, and I see the font on the right-hand side of the screen for my Mac font book or in your PC version, then that means that it's installed in your computer uh, and you can go back to Adobe Illustrator and work on your file. So let's go back to Adobe Illustrator. Here's World of Disney. It's called Open Sans. I'm going to go to my type tool, window menu, uh, type character menu or command T. And if I click onto it, I should see it down the list here under O for Open Sans because it's um, it's organized. Um, it's organized um, in, in the alphabet. There it is, open sans. Or I can double click onto the word in my type tool and I could type in O-P-E-N for open and it searches it as open sans and I can highlight and activate that way, okay? And now I can go back to selection tool and take that piece and bring it over to my design, whether it's deleting the old one, moving it in and adding the new one uh, above or below or in the book or outside of the book, you get to see it. You get to determine that, of course, okay? probably works a little bit better underneath it if we were going like a little bit more of a modernist approach, um, so to speak, okay? So I know there's a lot more to it, but I'm gonna stop it there. You know, there's styling, there's font styles. We would take more time to find those fonts, okay? But tonight I just wanted you to see, how do I get the shirt? How do I change the color of the shirt to match the art? And if I want to add a font, how do I get a font? And I showed you two ways to find that font, okay? So I know I hit you at 30 minutes, okay? But I wanted you guys to get a, a little bit uh, of a head start tonight, okay? Um, I will be in communication. If you have questions or issues, you can email me, okay? I'll still have my phone with me as I travel and there's Wi-Fi on the plane, of course. So if anything comes up, please contact me, let me know. Um, again, I just wanted to share this with you. 
Um, and I will see everyone on Tuesday, okay? Um, and then we'll go from there. Have fun, enjoy the process, and thank you to James for allowing me to use his artwork. All right, guys, have fun, and look forward to seeing your designs next week. Be safe.